Well, I know we have a packed session here, so I'd like to welcome you to the Fluke Biomedical 1QA Workflow Automation Demo Day. And I'd like to introduce a couple folks that we have on the line. We have Elliot Weldon and Justin Ross, our Fluke Biomedical 1QA product team. And uh, Justin, why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and let us let give us a little uh, background on what we're going to be watching here. Hello, I'm Justin Ross. I'm one of the channel partners uh, with Fluke Biomedical. And in this video, we are going to cover 1QA, the workflow automation software, and our newest automation device, the ProSim 8. So in the video, we're going to go through a quick monitor to PM. Uh, it's just highlighting some of the great capabilities we've packed into 1QA and showing just how it can streamline uh, your workflow, uh, reduce your time, and reduce errors. Uh, remember, though, this is not an actual PM of a manual. This is something we made up just to show all the capabilities of 1QA. So with that, let's go ahead and hit play, and uh, we'll get to going through it. In this video, we're going to show you how to do an alternative maintenance check-in procedure on a GE-4000 patient monitor utilizing the Fluke Biomedical ProSim 8 and a Fluke Biomedical ESA 615. Both of these devices are connected to 1QA at one time, and I'll be able to run through the entire checkout procedure of the Dash 4000. Please note, this is not a standard PM procedure taken out of the manual. This is something we just built and made up to, to show you some of the highlights of the Fluke Biomedical system. All right, let's get into it here. So here we are into, the, into 1QA, and you'll see our asset list, and we'll go down to our patient monitor and click on it. And here you can see the picture of the Dash 4000. So we know we have the correct monitor. You also notice we have all the information, the asset tag ID, its location, the device type, manufacturer, model, uh, the last time it was serviced, the next time it's due, as well as some special notes that I entered into here so I know exactly what I need to do to be able to perform this PM. I need a ProSumate and an ESA, which we have both on the desk. So let's go down and start the procedure. We'll click Run. And here we are. We have the date, starting time, and the tester. This is myself, and this is password protected, so this is like my electronic signature. This is the first place we're going to interact with our CMMS, where we have, um, we can either, this will auto automatically fill from the CMS, or we can enter it in. So we'll just enter in test 456. That's just made up number for today. We can see that we're doing a preventive maintenance type, and here's the asset information, the asset tag, the model, manufacturer, serial number. The next thing that's really nice is these are the two Fluke devices that are attached to the 1QA software, an ESA 615 safety analyzer, here's the serial number, and here's the date the of the calibration. A ProSim 8, the serial number, and the date of its calibration. Now I know that both units are within a year calibration and I'm good to go with my PM. If I ever have an issue, I can go back and find out exactly which mod, uh, which work orders these two devices were used on through the system. Moving down, let's start the visual inspection. So we can go through and follow the simple instructions and read them and select the appropriate answer. And you can notice that we don't just have that pass and fail. We took things that like says, if it fails, list below, uh, list the failure below. Well, let's mark these all pass. Oh, maybe this one is a fail. Let's see what happens. So if we fail something, we get a red X. So we either annotate this or correct a failure, in which we, it takes, we can mark pass then. And we'll write down here in the box, no issues found. All right, moving on to the next step. We're going to do a non-invasive blood pressure calibration. We'll need all these devices. We're going to need a mandrel for our Fluke Prosumate, the connector or adapter hose, the blood pressure cuff, the patient hose, and the ProSim 8. So we'll, I have all those on the desk. They're already connected. Uh, here's some special instructions we pulled out of the manual. And now here's the cert, how to enter the service mode. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll follow the instructions here. We'll go to main menu and monitor setup, service mode, enter the code. And we are into service mode. 
All right, next step. We're going to need to set up our non-invasive blood pressure. Here's a picture exactly how to set up. So here's my hose to my adapter and to my patient circuit with the cuff wrapped around the mandrel. That's already set up and done. And here's the instructions. We'd read through the instructions. We're going to go over here to calibrate and NIBP and CalCheck. All right, hold up there for a second. Here's a diagram showing us exactly the keystrokes. We pulled this out of the manual and embedded it, so we have no question about what we need to do. We're actually going to do two tests at once. We're going to do the non-invasive blood pressure leak test as well as the NIBP actually test. So let's go ahead and we're going to zero our pressure meter, which is built into the ProSim 8. All right, it beeped. That's done. Now we're going to go ahead and hit start right here run test point and we're going to start on our monitor now the monitor is going to go ahead and pump up and we'll see the pressure build right here in 1QA remember you never want to calibrate a monitor using a dynamic pre blood pressure you want to use it as a static solid pressure so that's what we're doing here this 1QA and ProSumate is also capable of doing leak checks uh, the pop-off valve check as well as has a built-in pressure source, but the GE monitor doesn't need those things It just needs to buy the manual just to do the couch check like this So we pumped up to 250 and it's going to bleed down to 240 When it says 240 here, we're going to go ahead and push the stop button here and if, if the pressure is within tolerance, which is plus or minus one millimeter mercury We'll get a pass if it's without that, we'll get a fail. So we're at 241. Wait till this goes to 240. It's bleeding down a little bit more to bleed down here. There's at 240. So I'll push the button here. And my pressure was within one millimeter mercury. So 240 here, 239.8. Spot on. Now the next thing he wants us to do is wait. After we read to 240 and see if we're losing more than one millimeter mercury in five seconds, that pressure is holding pretty flat. So I'm going to say yes, we're losing less than one millimeter mercury in five seconds. Oh, which is a pass, which means this test is done and this test is done. So we have our green lights on the right. So now let's move down to the next step. The next step is we're going to do the vital signs and alarm testing. Here's our instructions. We're going to test the high and low limit alarms. And I put a special instruction in here because yesterday when I was setting up, I grabbed the wrong temperature cable and it had the two black rings. I need the one with one black ring. So I have the verbiage and I have a picture right here showing me to use this temperature probe adapter. And then I scroll down and here's exactly how I need to set this up. Here's my, temp, my SpO2 to the finger probe. Here's that temperature cable I just showed you connected into the adapter, into the monitor. My ECG, uh, my non-invasive blood pressure that we left in from the prior step. So that's good to go. Now watch this. I go down to the next step here, and we're going to test all the high alarm limits with the accession of SpO2 because we can't have too high SpO2. So I just have a trip for a low alarm. So here we go. We'll click in here. You'll notice once I hit start on 1QA, if you look at the ProSim 8, it now says it's in remote mode. So it is taking care of all the functions of the patient monitor at one time. I didn't have to do anything there. So we're good to go there. Let's go ahead and hit non-invasive blood pressure, and it's going to start doing that. So my heart rate's 160, so I'll put it in here, 160. All right, my ECG amplitude is displayed as one millivolt right there. Good. My waveform looks pretty good, so we'll mark yes. My respiration rate is supposed to be 40. We're reading at 39, 40. It's right on the line, so we'll put 40 in there. The temperature is supposed to be 37.5. We're reading 37.6. SpO2, we have set at 90. We are reading 89. All right, now our blood pressures. This is just to verify that we can take a diastolic blood pressure. 
Uh, since we're over pressure, it's going to take a little bit for it to catch it the first time. And you could hear it ran through once. It's running it through the second time. And there we have a capture of 275 over 190. So we'll put that into here. Systolic, 275. Diastolic, 190. And our map or our mean is 227. And we are shooting for a 255 over 195 with 215. So we're pretty close. Um, it's the first time up, but we're not going for accuracy here. We're just making sure all these alarms are in fact sounding. So you can see by our rates, we're over all of them. Okay, so that's good. Now let's go to the next step, which is a normal vital signs rhythm. I click there, and you'll see instantaneously all of the parameters are dropping back within line. Now non-invasive blood pressure is still out, so let's run our non-invasive blood pressure again. All right, so all of our alarms are shut off. Our heart rate, we have set at 60, and we're displaying 60, which is good, because we only had a tolerance of one. Um, our ECG amplitude is still ranging at one millivolt. The ECG waveform, there's a little bit of interference on there. I think we have a bad lead. So we can replace that for today. We'll call it good. Our respirations, that has a tolerance of 2. So we're reading at 20. It was set at 20. So we'll put that in here and see if we pass. That's a passing score. Our temperature is now at 32. Our SpO2 is reading 96. So we're only off by 1. Now let's look at our blood pressure again as it's still adjusting itself down all right here we go 129 over 82 with a mean of 101 so put that in here 129 over 82 and 101 now if i was afraid this was a little bit too high i could run it again but this is just for demo purposes so we're going to call it good now let's see if we can trip all those low alarms so here we go we're going to click in here and it's going to change all the parameters on the prosum 8. Notice I didn't touch anything on this prosum 8. And everything has changed. So I didn't even have to know how to set this up. Everything changed automatically for me. My heart rate's dropping. My respirations are dropping. So we're getting an alarm. My SpO2 is dropping. Here we go. So we have a heart rate of 40. And over here it's reading 40. The amplitude is still reading. One millivolt. The ECG waveform still looks pretty good. My respirations are 15. I should alarm here in a little bit here because our, our low is five. So we're still above what our respiration rate should be. Um, my SpO2 is at 73. Uh, it's the low alarms for 90, so let's go ahead and we'll put my SpO2 in here. 73. My temperature is reading 30. Okay. And my blood pressure. All right, here we go. And our alarm, we're now at 56 over 27 with a mean of 36, which puts us out of tolerance. And alarm went off, so let's go ahead and we'll set this at 56, 27, and 36. All right, we did all those parameters without having to touch the person eight. So now we can roll right into our electrical safety test. So you'll see, so silence that so we can hear better. In our electrical safety test, here's what we're going to do. We're going to fall on FP99, and here is the setup for it. So, let me go ahead and we'll move my ECG leads. Up to my safety analyzer. All right. Now, I'm going to leave this here for a second because I have to zero out my leads. So... There's my setup, so I know exactly how to set up for my test, my ECG leads, and I'm going to take my red alligator clip back to here. 
but I know from running this a few times, I have to zero up my leads first. So let's go ahead and we'll move down to this electrical safety and we're going to push run component here. Now it wants me to connect it to my null post. So follow my instructions. We're already connected. We'll zero that out. Now we're going to connect this to that test point that we showed in the prior instructions. All right, and we're going to continue. And again, this might not be the way you do electrical safety. This is just an example. And you see it automatically generated a resistance. Push run on the next one. Continue. Again, I'm not pushing any buttons on electrical safety analyzer. I'm not adjusting anything. I'm simply hitting run and make sure it's powered on. All the results are automatically populated. We have passes there. We're going to move down to the next to the applied parts test. And here's how to set it up. Here's the diagram. And here's a picture. So we'll follow, make sure we have the picture set up. Yep, we're connected over there. And let's go ahead and we'll start this test. Look at this. All this data is automatically populated. So a lot of people make the argument about why well, we don't want to do electrical safety anymore. It takes too long. I'm not doing anything. The system is recording all these results for me already automatically. So why not? No special notes. And we'll put a PM sticker on it. That's our last green checkbox over here. At the bottom, we have a green light, which means the PM procedure has been completed. We'll click done, and this is going to go ahead and save it over to our reports. From here, this is our results. We can make different forms of a report. We can do a modified report. We can do the all report, all the data. Here's our test. We just passed it. So we can modify these reports and what data you want to come over to your PC. So you see in this example, it has all the data included into this, but we can also get rid of a lot of these fields that you don't want to bring brought over like the pictures and stuff and simply import this back into your CMMS platform or attach it as a PDF. Thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you in our next video. Great. Thank you, Justin. That was a, a great video and I'll be uh, sending out um, a link to that video. So if you want to watch that again, share with colleagues, uh, we'll get that back out to you. Um, I want to shift gears over to Elliot Weldon, our application special specialist. Elliot, can you tell, uh, share with the, the, the attendees here on how to sign up? Sure. Thanks, Dan. Um, at flukebiomedical.com slash 1QA is where you can find the 1QA free trial. Um, it's currently set up for a 30 a 30 day free trial, but um, you can see my email address there, Elliot.Weldon at flukebiomedical.com. Uh, if you want to sign up for the trial, just send me an email and I will get you set up with the training and I can also extend out the the trial for um, a couple more months. Um, just get everybody um, on the call up up and running with one QA. Um, I'd, I'd like to share my screen right now just to kind of walk through how the how the sign up works. It's it's pretty simple. Can, perfect. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Elliot. At biomedical.com slash one QA, the top of the screen, you're gonna see a start free trial today. Select start free trial. And then here's the the form that needs to be filled out. First name, last name, email. Company would be maybe um, the name of your ISO or, or hospital. Tenant would be what, what we're going to classify your account. So most people would go with um, the name of your hospital plus biomed. Team size, just, just um, insert how many biomeds you have on your team. And then country, zip code, phone number, password. There is, there are rules on the password. So a minimum of eight characters, lowercase, uppercase, numeric, and special character. Um, after you fill this form out, you'll get an email. 
and then from the email it'll walk you through how to download the software again if there's any questions please just email me i'm here to help everybody so um that's pretty much how you sign up for for one qa and uh i will pass it back to dan great thank you elliot all right i am going to go back to my screen all right so make sure you you jot down elliot's email so if you if you want uh to schedule a quick 15 minute quick start with them he is more than happy to schedule that with you and get you up and running um right away but uh before we jump into the q a i would like to uh ask the audience a quick poll so edna if you could launch our poll And that poll question actually has been launched. So the question is, how do you record your PM results? And there are four options, directly into a PC, pen and paper and hand entry into a PC, pen and paper in a filing cabinet, or we do nothing, just pass fail stickers. So I will give the audience about 30 seconds to enter their responses. And then we will close the poll and I'll share the results with the team. And once again, thanks everyone for entering your responses to this poll question. And the poll is closing now. And I'll share the results. So 65% indicated directly into a PC, 22% indicated pen and paper and hand entry into PC, and then the additional 5% each, pen and paper in a filing cabinet, and we do nothing, just pass and fill stickers. Awesome, well, these are great results, and one QA for everybody who's entering directly into the PC, one QA is a great tool to help them out. Uh, if you already have a CMMS, we have an open API, so it makes interfacing one QA to your CMMS so easy to do. Everybody who's already taking notes and entering into the PC later on, we can help you out as well. So one QA is really a great program to anybody. If you're in a biomed shop, if you're an ISO, if you're a service provider, it's a really great solution to help you all out. So with that, I think we have questions think now. We, we have, we've been, getting some great questions in. And um, first question, Justin, I'm just gonna, we have about six minutes left, so I wanna make sure we try to get as many as we can and don't hesitate to throw some more uh, questions our direction. But uh, Justin, can you can you use one QA with a non-fluke biomedical device? You sure can. In this video, you saw, you saw that we automated everything. So that automatically pulled the results right from the Fluke device and in. We can also build the questions so that you can hand enter the results. Um, so if maybe today you don't have the Fluke Biomedical ESA, maybe you have a competition, you can still hand enter those results into it, and but still get all the other benefits that one QA brings, like the pictures and PDFs and all the data into that one central repository. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, another question about one QA was, um, can you use it offline? Because a lot of places in the hospital, I, we don't we don't have a, a strong Wi-Fi connection. Sure can. So that's a we can go to when we first log into one QA, we can actually go out and lock out our license, which puts it into a offline mode and downloads all the data. When you're in that, the only thing that you can't do is build or modify procedures. So when you're in the offline mode, you can't do those two things. Uh, but other than that, you have all the full capabilities of one QA when you're offline. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, another question: We, you know, our our CMMS stores all of our assets. Do they do they need to be stored in one QA also? Yes, but it's really easy to do. We can take your assets off of uh, your uh, CMMS platform, export them into an Excel database and then import them as a batch into uh, one QA. So it does serve as a backup for your database as well. You know, if something were ever happened and you lose 
your uh, CMMS capability or it's down today, you're switching, whatever it might be, OneQA backs everything up to the cloud. So you can always access your test records at any point in time through, through the OneQA, as well as that entire asset list. And that's really important in modern days with cybersecurity being such a threat. Um, it seems to be a big topic. So what a great way to back up all your data. Perfect, thank you, Justin. Uh, another question here is: was time savings? Do we do we have any any data points for for time savings with use, utilizing OneQA? Oh, another good one. Yes, um, we're showing about approximately a thirty percent reduction in time. Um, that's found two ways and a few different ways. I shouldn't say two, a few ways. One is it's pulling all the data together, so. You don't have to carry your service manual and you know a notebook with all your passwords and the notes on how to get into things. It's all right there. It's also saving time on when you have a newer tech coming into the shop and they might not be familiar with the piece of equipment or how to perform the PM. The ability to add those uh, pictures and hints and tips really makes it a much easier job for them and they're able to get through their PMs much more rapidly, which frees them up to do things like repairs and that big pile of broken gear in a corner of every biomed shop, it finally gives us a chance to go get that taken care of. So we're showing on an average about a 30% reduction in time. Perfect, thank you, Justin. And you you kind of touched this on the non-fluke equipment, but what's the difference between automation and workflow automation? Oh, that's a great question too. So with automation, we, this is talked about a lot right now where we're gonna take something. So from our CMS device, and it's gonna go out and it's gonna talk to an analyzer and bring the device, the data back in. And it's just like a single line or just bringing that data back and forth to the analyzer. So your steps might already be in CMS, it just reaches out, pulls it down, bring it back. But with workflow automation, we're gonna add a lot more to it. It's pulling in all the other facets that we need to complete our job as a biomedical equipment technician. It's gonna pull in the data from the service manual, it's pulling in passwords, it's pulling in notes, it's pulling in location, and all the stuff that you need to complete your job, all that data is coming into one singular hub. And then we can go into this and we can do things like build a repair procedure, a alternative maintenance procedure, an in-service procedure, and you can have multiple procedures for each device. So say today you bring an incoming inspection, uh, you go check it six months from now, you do, you find an issue, well now you can open up a service repair and it's gonna go through all these different steps, but all that data is all collected back into here. All the interoperable fluke devices then is gonna log the make, model, and serial numbers of all those devices. So you can go back and track which p devices each one of your fluke analyzers was used on. So it's not just one way street between your CMS and a device, it's pulling in all this other data right to your fingertips as the technician. So I need to have one screen open and I can be doing everything off of that one screen versus having to flip back and forth between multiple screens and libraries and you know all the mess we do on a daily basis. That, that helped that one out? I think so. No, thank you, Justin. Well, we are we are coming close to a close on this, and that's all the questions I have. So, thank you so much for joining us today. And you know, remember, please visit this. You know, with One QA, it is a it's a free trial. You have 30 days, and then if 30 days doesn't give you enough time, definitely reach out to our One QA team, and they typically can extend that time to give you more time to really evaluate the power of this tool. But um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Justin, Elliot, Enid, or I'm sorry, Edna. And um, again, have a great remainder of your day.